Before Jody, before Casey, before OJ and the Menendez brothers, there was Pam. Pamela Smart's 1991 trial for the murder of her husband was the first to be broadcast in its entirety. The lurid, sex-soaked tale of betrayal and murder, complete with a gang of underage accomplices, fed the public's appetite for scandal. More than two decades after she received a life sentence, Pam continues to maintain her innocence and to make compelling arguments questioning the validity of her trial. In this exclusive interview with journalist Diane Diamond, Pam answers difficult questions about those infamous tapes. You are instructing Cecilia to lie. Yes, I am. Shares her feelings about the Hollywood versions of her story. I think she played me like a complete airhead. And tells us what life is like today for Pamela Smart. The pivotal pieces of evidence in the prosecution's case against Pamela Smart were the recorded conversations between Pam and high school student Cecilia Pierce. Those tapes are what the jury says they pinned that guilty verdict on. And as a result, Pam Smart is in prison for the rest of her life. The tapes themselves are extremely hard to decepher. There are huge gaps, they're inaudible, you can't hear them. Equally frustrating for Pam are the transcriptions. During the trial, these were used to decode the tapes. However, it was never revealed who made the transcriptions and whether or not they were complete or based on edited tapes. They weren't really an accurate version of the entire conversations that happened. They made four tapes and they only entered two of them. So they were transcribed, but you never knew who did the actual transcription? No, all the way up until a month ago, I was still trying to find out. I wrote the attorney general's office, we called the dairy police, and everyone is saying they don't have that information. Despite the mysterious transcriptions and inaudible portions, the tapes still contain seemingly damning information. On the portions of the tapes that the jurors heard and have a transcript for, yes. You are instructing Cecilia to lie. Yes, I am. Because I was afraid that she was going to admit about the affair, and I was scared. Then in response, Cecilia says to you that she's sick of lying. And mm -hmm. you say, well, you know, I'm just telling you that if you tell the truth, you're going to be an right. accessory to murder. Yeah, and you say you're you're telling her fibs to try to get her to right. tell the truth. In this transcript, you're saying if you tell the truth, you're going to be an accessory right. to murder. In other words, shut up. Right. How I, does well, that I want her to trying tell. To get the truth? Because I want her to tell me necessarily, but I don't want her to get arrested because then I'm not going to be able to speak to her. I just needed to know for my own sanity, like, was this really true? Is this really how this happened? Even to this day, right now, I still don't know that I'm convinced that Bill was the one who actually pulled the trigger. Somewhere in my own mind. I didn't want Bill to be the one that pulled the trigger. I didn't want it to be him because I felt so bad about everything. Cecilia says, he's going to say that you knew before it happened, which is the truth. And you say, right. Well, then I'll have to say, no, I didn't. And then they're either going to believe, believe me, me or they're going to believe a 16-year-old who's in the slammer. Right. Read the first part again. He's not going to say you offered to pay him. He's going to say that you knew right. about it okay. before it happened, which is the truth. Hang on. Say, right. right. Okay, hang on. When I'm saying right, when you're listening to the conversation or you're looking at it on paper, it's two different things. As a person is talking to you and you're saying, you're shaking your head, yes, you know, you're saying right, yeah, uh-huh, while they're talking to you. But when they lay it on paper, it looks like you said right or yeah to the last statement that they said. And that's not what happened there. And so that's why bringing in a transcript versus bringing in the original version tells a different story when it's laying flat on paper. We're back to why didn't you just call the police and say, hey, I don't know. I got something to admit. Yeah, I wish I, I would have. Fair. I wish I would have. I wish I would have told them that the first night, you know, but I didn't. 
Although Pam has regrets, she still believes that the transcripts are misleading. For Pam, they're just one of many reasons her trial was botched. In the immediate aftermath of her husband's murder, Pamela Smart wasted no time talking to the press. In turn, the press embraced Pam. There was nothing for me to hide, so I wasn't feeling like I had to be cautious. But when high school student Billy Flynn came forward claiming that he and three of his friends had conspired with Pam to kill Greg, Pam's relationship with the media changed forever. Based on Flynn's testimony, Pam was arrested and charged. Soon, the national news media descended on Derry, New Hampshire, making Pam the center of a firestorm. The media saturation was unbelievable. She's guilty. She's the master manipulator. She's an ice princess. The media attention was a red flag for Pam's defense team. They feared that overexposure would bias any of the locally selected jurors. Pam's lawyers repeatedly asked for a change of venue. They wanted to appeal on the issue of media saturation, of the judge's refusal to sequester the jurors so they would be immune from all of that media coverage. Their request was denied. Soon, Pam's defense team's fears were confirmed. There were several reports of juror misconduct that were never followed up. They go back to Judge Gray a second time after it's learned that a juror has tape recorded herself every night after the testimony and now is trying to sell those tapes to Pam's appellate attorney. The judge hears this information and says, no, nope, no cause for a new trial. The juror wasn't the only one who was attempting to cash in on Pam's trial. Hollywood soon came to Derry, New Hampshire. While Pam's trial was still underway, a made-for-TV movie starring Helen Hunt was quickly produced and aired. That had a whole bunch of scenes that supposedly happened that never happened. It made me angry, you know, because I feel like a lot of people believe everything they see on TV. Helen Hunt played you. Helen do you, Hunt do you played think she me. captured your essence? Not at all. I think she played me like a complete airhead. A few years later, To Die For was released. This high-profile film starring Nicole Kidman was loosely adapted from Pam's story. To Die For, to me, was even worse. Somehow in that story, I got changed into a weather girl, from a, from a teacher to a weather girl now. And at the end of the movie, I'm released from prison and I'm killed. And they ice skate over my dead body. So obviously if you're watching the movie and you know I'm very much alive still, then you would know that not everything in this movie is true, but there's people who swear up and down that the whole movie is true. And so people watch these things and then they say, oh yeah, I remember that case. And they're really remembering the movie. To this day, Pam and her supporters blame the media saturation for creating an environment where the integrity of the trial was compromised. So much so, that jurors felt free to talk about the trial in public while it was still going on. During deliberations, the jury was out deliberating my fate. My mother received a phone call. A man said that he was in a bar. One of my jurors was in the bar discussing my case and how he was gonna vote guilty. This person that was calling my mother really didn't want to be involved, but they said, I think you need to let Pam's lawyers know this. Well, my mom had been receiving some threatening phone calls, so she already had a police tap on the phone. We went into the judge's chambers the next day. We were saying, basically, this is why we wanted the jury sequestered. The guy's out in a bar. He's, he's discussing the case. Here's the phone call. Judge Gray basically said, well, let's call the juror in. Hey, were you in a bar discussing this case? The guy said, no. OK, all right, no mistrial. While all of Pam's appeals have been exhausted, she has not given up. Pete, you got a knife out there. You want to do is cut his toe. That was the plan? Yeah. I went over the plan of how to kill Greg. I would have rather stabbed Greg than shoot him because the gun was too loud. One of your friends from school told me how smart you are and that if you were going to kill somebody. You wouldn't have picked teenagers to I do it. absolutely wouldn't. This is the most haphazard murder 
plot I ever heard of in my life. It's worse than a movie, even though it is a movie. On one level, they want to say, oh, I'm so smart, I'm this mass manipulator or whatever. But at the same time, I'm so stupid that I think that all of these teenagers are going to keep a murder plot quiet for forever. No, I mean, that's, that doesn't even make sense. While Pam didn't pull the trigger, she received a life sentence for the death of Greg Smart. But by 2015, all four of the young men charged in the murder were released from prison. I was angry, but I can't say I was surprised. They've curried favor and were housed in minimum security and medium security prisons, were given deals and then given sentence reductions, made their first parole boards and went home. And I, I have life in prison. I've spent more time incarcerated than I have in the free world already. I have absolutely no chance of parole. Even though there appears to be no hope, Pam hasn't given up. I am filing a petition to the New Hampshire governor for a commutation of sentence. Basically, it's an act of mercy. It's not a pardon where you're absolved of guilt. It's just a reduction in sentence. Even if he says, OK, well, I'm going to give you 25 to life, then I would go before parole board. He could give me anything. He could give me 50 years, and there would be an end somewhere. You know, there'd be a, a chance. Pam has lived more than half of her life in prison. What do you imagine your life would have been like if you had never met Billy Flynn? Where would you be today? Probably married with kids, probably still married to Greg, probably have grown children now. What else have you done here in prison with the other inmates? I got two master's degrees while I was here, so one in law and one in English literature. I worked as a teacher's aide for over 20 years, helping women with their GEDs and a lot of women can earn associates and bachelor's degrees, so I tutor and help a lot of women. This is like the only place I've ever taught, actually. <laughs> what so, are your plans if you ever get out of here? I work with women that are HIV positive or have AIDS and for years here, and I enjoy that line of work. So I would really, I have the aspirations to work for the United Nations as an um, ambassador for HIV and AIDS for children, especially. <laughs>